Okay, we're running. We're up and running. So here we are, uh, ladies and gentlemen, with uh, my second brew day video, a mere eight years after the first one. So just to fill you in on the blanks as to what's happening, I've come back to brewing after a, step, uh, after a, a number of years away, really. Uh, but I made a video about eight years ago about brewing beer, about m me brewing beer, a sort of totally random video on my channel but it was quite popular it was quite popular it got quite a number of views a few thousand views but it's one video that over the years people have referred back to to me and said i wish you'd do another video like that so i thought that would be kind of fun uh, to do and to add a few bits so this is what i propose to do here uh i'm not going to convince you to take up brewing i'm not making a video also for people who watch 10 homebrew videos a day, right? There's lots of other videos from people who are way more boring than I am, who will, in the most tedious voice that they can muster, tell you all about different aspects of the process and the things that you can do. What I want to do is to show you what I do, um, maybe give you a few stories along the way, that kind of thing. Okay, so probably what the first thing I should do, I, I'll tell you what we're going to be brewing. Uh, then I'll show you the ingredients which I recorded last night. Then I'll just roughly take you through the steps of the process. And then after we've done that, uh, what I'll do is then, as I go through all the process, I'll, I'll show you it. So I'll show you the mashing, I'll show you the boiling, uh, I'll show you the, the, the fermenting side of it, and then the racking it off. We're going to be putting it into bottles for this brew, which is something I very rarely do, because it's too much trouble, quite frankly. Okay, so what we're brewing today is we're brewing a Belgian double. Belgian double, Belgian double, Belgian double. That is a Belgian double. In fact, I think West Mal was a, a pretty much the original uh, abbey, I think, in Belgium for this style of beer. Um, interesting style of beer, dark beer, about 7%, something like that. And it is a style of beer that is a bit sort of fruity, estery, the kind of tastes that you would find in an old ale, I would say. But... but um, not sweet like an old ale, right? It's more attenuated than that. It's a drier beer. So it's a strange kind of combination there. Okay, so that's what we're looking at brewing. So let me stop you looking at me. This will probably be the last time you'll see me. Yeah, you'll be pleased to hear. So let me stop this and I'll show you the bit of footage that I recorded last night that shows you the ingredients. And then we'll come back here and have a little look at what we're going to be doing. Okay, so this panel is actually a little bit Doctor Who-like. We've gone back in time to the day before. So I can just show you the ingredients that are going to go into this beer. And I'm just discussing a little bit. I won't discuss the process, but, you know, I said we're creating a, a Belgian double here. Uh, so we need the basis. The basis, of course, of the mash uh, is malt. Okay, malted barley. And then we've got Dingerman's. All, most of this is Dingerman's product because they're a Belgian company. This is their Pilsen malt. So it's a very, very lightly kilned malt. It will have a lot of diastatic activity. And that needs to form the basis of your malt, really, because it's, that, it's those enzymes in there that convert the starches to the sugars when you add in that warm water, which is what the mashing process is, effectively, just bathing it in warm water at the right temperature. And so most of your malt has to be that type. You can always mix other things in as long as you don't get too much. If you put too much of all things in that don't have that diastatic activity, that's when you get into a little bit of trouble. We're going to be adding in seven kilos of that. We're going to be adding in half of this, half a kilo of wheat malt, probably to add a bit of mouthfeel and a bit of head retention and a little effect of taste as well. If you've had a wheat beer, you'll understand that. We're not adding in too much of that, 500 grams. And then we're adding in half of that, so 350 grams of this Dingman Special B. This is one of the things that's going to add to the taste, give it the taste that we want in this double. And this is, it's an interesting process. It's a double kilning process, apparently. I mean, this is an example of a malt here. It's going to add some colour, it's going to add to the taste. This will have low diastatic activity. This is going to do very much on its own. If you just stuck this in the 64 to 68 degree water, nothing's going to happen other than it's going to get wet, obviously, and get a bit mushy. Um, but when you mix it in with things that can provide those enzymes, then you can get the, the, the sugars out of that as well. Once that's all mashed out, then we have this stuff as well. Belgian candy rocks, Belgian candy... Um, Syrup is something that is used for some of these Belgian beers, and apparently it is a sort of waste product of the sugar beet refining process, whereby you heat and cool and heat and cool and heat and cool the syrup that you've got off the sugar beet, and each time you create a bit more sucrose and what is left, I, I am led to believe, is this strange, dark, sugary-looking stuff. It's a sort of caramelised uh, colour. It's one of these sort of Maillard reactions that you see all along cooking that give you those kinds of burnt tastes. You know, the same as when you heat your pan up, so it's smoking hot and then chuck your steak in, and that gives you a little bit taste on that. It's the same kind of thing there. So these things are providing big taste components to the beer. The hops are just steering goldings. It's not a very heavily hopped uh, beer. But then the other thing that provides a big kick for the taste is, is using the right yeast. And this is a Belgian Abbey yeast. Okay, I'm putting this back in the fridge now, and then I'll, I'll return you back to tomorrow <laughs> for the rest of the video. Okay, so at this point you'll be pleased to know you don't have to look at me anymore. Uh, so what I need to give you first then is just a little bit of a run through of where we're at. You saw the grains up there. The grains are all in that bucket. Those grains are going to go in this, which is the mash tun. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about mashing later on. But effectively what we're going to do, we're going to take some water out of this boiler. This boiler that has, I don't know if you can see, drip for me, drip for me. Okay, well, it's, there we go, a leaking tap. So I'm going to have to solve that before that gets full of hot wort. I have a spare tap if needs be. I'm going to take some water out of there. I'm going to put that hot water in there. 
these are going to be steeped in that hot water and the enzymes within that malt will convert the starches into sugars and duly it will get sweeter as the hour goes on and then we'll drain off the hot wort, run a bit more water through it. You can see we've got some pipes to assist in that. There are slits in the bottom of these pipes and so it acts as a kind of filter. We'll run more water through it, get, uh, get strain those sugars off the malt, put the malt in here, boil it up with some hops drain it off here obviously put a vessel underneath otherwise it'll just piss out all over the floor obviously that wouldn't be a very good technique for brewing um good technique for giving you a rotting concrete floor as it drained into your floor of course and then once it's cooled down we put it in the fermenter we pitch the yeast the smack pack of yeast which we started uh, i gave that a little smack not, not in a sexual sense, but a good hard smack in some ways to, to burst that packet. That is there in the house, a little bit warmer, preparing itself. We will be fermenting in that once that's been sanitised. And then you need to put it in a vessel, don't you? And what I would usually do is to put it in some of these Cornelius kegs. Let's say we're making a brew that's 30 litres that would fit into two of these. They'll hold 38 litres, in fact. But 30 litres would be 60 of these bottles. Right. 60 of these bottles. <clears throat> 60 bottles you've got to clean. That's 60 bottles you've then got to sanitise. That's 60 bottles you've then got to add a little bit of priming sugar. That's 60 bottles that you're going to have to put a crown cork on the top. One of those metal caps. It's a lot of fanning about, quite honestly, and I can't be arsed with it. But this is a bit of a special beer. A beer that will nicely keep. It's a nice strong beer. So it's kind of worth it. So it would be kind of nice to have those bottles. Put them in my temperature controlled... Uh, uh, Kieser fridge come freezer uh, there so that is the plan I aim to try and show you all the steps of that so what I need to do now is get my water at the right temperature which is going to be about 72 degrees to give me about 64 degrees here be quite a stiff mash to fit all that grain in there um, so I'll do that and then I'll tell you a little bit about more about the mash once I've done that okie dokie let's crack on just a little bit of record as I'm stirring this in there just to show you what is involved here. So it's important to make sure that you mix it in well. Right? You, what you don't want is any little pockets like this look. If you leave those then it can't work its little wonders. And it's an interesting process this. You need to get this right sort of first go here. The the systems that are available to homebrewers now are much better. You can do what's called a stepped mash, which we'll maybe discuss in a few minutes. Uh, but what they do is they recirculate the wort round. And that's really, really helpful. They have a boiler in the bottom, uh, heating elements in the bottom, so that what you can actually do is, you can actually, if you get the temperature wrong, if you get something wrong, it's not the end of the world. It will fix the temperature for you. This is really a one-shot thing, especially when you have this really, really full. I have sometimes have this even fuller than, than I've got it now, and so there isn't a lot of leeway. If you've got the temperature wrong, you've really, really messed it up, uh, to be honest. There's no way back. Uh, but to be fair, the other side of the coin is to really get the temperature wrong, you've got to have done something uh, pretty extreme. Okay, so I'm going to finish mixing this, and then I'll talk, you, uh, uh, talk to you a little bit more about it. Okay, so here we are, we're back again. We've mixed it all in and we've got a little bit of a situation here, which is, as you can see from that, we're at 60 degrees, we want to be at 64 degrees, and that is a bit too far off. Um, so we can resolve that. We can resolve that. We've mixed it in. It looks like a kind of porridge, which is what you want. We've mixed it in. We've got a bit of space. If I really heat some water up, I can get that up to temperature. So we've got some water there. The residual of what we had before, that'll be warm enough. When I stop speaking to you, I'll mix that in and I'll resolve that temperature. But it's not the worst thing in the world because what we're going to be doing is a single step mash here. Where you just put it in the water at the temperature for mashing, leave it there for an hour and those starches get converted into sugars. But what this recipe actually called for uh, was, a, I think, a three stage mash, a stepped mash program where you keep raising the temperature which you obviously can't do with this equipment you need some more spangly equipment with a with a work pump that's recirculating the liquid so you can heat it up from the element and you get these ones now they're really spangly you can tell it what to do hold it at this temperature for half an hour then take it to this temperature and it'll do it all for you um, 
lovely to have one of those things but I haven't but to be quite honest how necessary a step mash is for a beer like this where you're using a lot of Pilsen malt it will be a well modified malt it probably really should not be necessary so let me just describe to you uh, the process here of malting so this is what happens is that the maltster takes the barley and the barley if you like it is like a little battery isn't it it's got all the energy there to start that little seedling developing to create a new barley plant right so it's got all that energy locked in there but it's hard to get to it and we want to get to that energy get to those starches turn them into sugars so the plant will do that itself in actual fact because if it wants to germinate it has to release those starches so what you do is you lay it out there uh, you damp it and you allow it to germinate and when it germinates it does two things it starts to release those starches and it creates the enzymes that allows that process uh, to convert those starches and, to, and to, to break them down so that they can be utilized by the plant. The key for the maltster is to get the timing right. If you stop that, that process, that malting process too soon, then what will happen is it won't be far enough down the line that the starches won't be properly unlocked. We won't be able to get access to them as well. And we won't have the enzymes. So you've got to wait long enough, and that's called the mash being properly modified or fully modified. Most mashes today are fully modified, and so you don't really need a stepped mash because they've got enough of those enzymes in there. And we're going to be utilizing the enzymes in the process that we are doing here. Uh, how do I get it to there? Or at least I would do if I'd got the bloody temperature right, but I'll rectify that in a minute. Um, if you allow it to go too long as a maltster, then effectively then you start burning through those sugars. The plant, the little, the little uh, ear of barley is utilising the sugars rather than you. And that obviously isn't a situation you want. It's a clever business. And then what the maltster will do is dry it out, stop the process, give it a very mild kilning to create a pale malt or to create a, a pilsen malt, etc., etc., which is the basis of your beer but then you'll take some of those malts and kiln them more and that will give you crystal malts and chocolate malts roasted malts eventually that are black that are burnt uh, and that'll give you a lot of these speciality malts and you can put a small amount of those malts in what you call your grist and put it in uh, your mash tun and they don't have the same diastatic activity they haven't got those enzymes those enzymes have been destroyed ladies and gentlemen by the kilning but it doesn't matter as long as you don't put too much in they will utilize the enzymes that are in the rest of the malt okay so that's how it works and so you use these small amounts of these darker malts etc etc to give you taste uh, and some body etc etc head retention sometimes for the for the beer uh, but the majority of it needs to be modified malt with high diastatic activity for the malting process to work so that is where we are at now and that is in here and that will be molting away when I add a little bit more hot water it, to be honest even at 60 degrees it's going to work because what you have is the two enzymes that are important here one of them works in that lower temperature range I think 58 to about 65 66 something like that and the next one kicks in from about 63 64 to about 70 degrees the higher temperature range uh, doesn't give you as fermentable sugars so that will give you a beer with a sweeter characteristic that doesn't attenuate as much in the lower temperature range uh, it produces sugars that the yeasts can break down very readily and it will give you therefore a drier beer a more attenuated beer more of the sugar turns to alcohol as one of the uh, one of the large brewers used to be their catchphrase i think at one time now, because we're trying to create a, dark, uh, a drier beer, actually the fact that we've started off a little bit low isn't it's too bad a thing. That water is boiling now, so I'm going to mix some of that in and get it up to the right temperature. Okay. Okay, so it's good news. We've got it now. We're at 65 degrees, which is, which is wonderful. That's kind of where we want it to be. 64 degrees was my aiming point. I've hit 65. I'm, I'm happy with that. I'll now leave that. And that will gradually turn those starches into sugars. Ideally, we want a situation should take about an hour where all the starch is converted into sugars. You can use iodine to test for that because iodine will test for starch. It goes a sort of dark, blacky purple colour. I always used to do that. I always used to do a starch test. I don't bother now uh, for a couple of reasons, really. 
one is that generally it kind of worked after the period anyway. It was never a problem. The other thing is that by the time you then pissed about running it out, recirculated some of it through the grains a few times because that allows the grains to act as a filter and the work you get out is a bit clearer. Uh, gets rid of some of the crap. By the time you've done that, by the time you've then put it in your boiler, by the time you've then, your boiler's raised it to a temperature beyond which the enzyme, enzyme, enzymatic activity can kick in. Um, any starches that remain will have been dealt with. It's had another sort of 15, 20 minutes with all of that, so it isn't a, a problem. What is interesting is that often if you taste this, and I don't know what it will taste like yet, is that if you put your finger in it, it's just starting to become a little bit sweet. And you will see over the course of the hour how it will become sweeter and sweeter. And it will be really, really sweet at the end. So that gives you a sort of very tangible way of seeing what is happening uh, with regard to that. A satisfying way. And that also brings me perhaps to the next thing which I should mention, which is uh, sort of um, the sanitization side of it. So one thing with brewing is it's kind of a game of two halves, I think. Uh, and you've got sort of pre the end of boil and, and after the end of boil. And, and it's once that boil is finished that you really have to start taking things a little bit more seriously. Because at this stage, we know whatever happens, there's going to be an hour's rolling boil. Right. And that's going to... You know, I, if I cough into this beer a great green load of phlegm, which I don't do, if anybody ever comes around for a drink, by the way, but if I do, it's actually not the end of the world because the boil's going to take these things out. If my if I leave my spoon here with a bit of a uh, bit of malt on it, right, and it picks up a few nasties. Uh, if you wild yeasts or mold spores or something, it isn't the end of the world because it's all going to be boiled for an hour. But once you've gone through that boil, it all gets a little bit more serious then because then that's the point where suddenly anything that it comes into contact, once you've brought the temperature down, potentially can introduce an infection to your beer and can ruin what you're doing. And especially with a beer like this where I'm going to have had to clean Dozens and dozens of bottles. Now I'm going to have to sanitise dozens and dozens of bottles. Okay, you don't want to go through all that uh, just to find that somewhere along the line you've messed it up because you've not been sanitary enough. So the boiling point is the key point. That's when you can't relax quite as much. At this point, as long as the temperatures are right and you don't slip, spill your beer all over the garage floor, right, you, you're pretty much good to go. So all of that kind of neatly segues into talking about cleaning and sanitation, which we should talk about now. And indeed, there's a bit of sanitation uh, that I'm starting even now. Uh, to me, and I think a lot of people would agree with this, cleaning and sanitation are different operations. And it's worth viewing them as different operations, albeit you can kind of do them in the same operation. But I tend not to. Cleaning is a process of getting all the crud, all the crap, all the detritus off your kit and keeping it clean. Keeping all the surfaces clean, there's a bit of brown tape on there, which is all that is. It's not spilt stuff, it's right some parcel tape on it at one point. But the surfaces are clean, and that's what it's all about, getting all the, all the dirt away. Because you cannot sanitise dirty equipment. Uh, you've got to clean it first. And then once you've done that, then you can sanitise. Sanitise is effectively trying to get those surfaces as sterile as you can. You might not achieve sterility, but you're getting them sufficiently sterile that you can brew beer uh, within them. But you cannot do that with a dirty surface. My kind of philosophy, and it's not a sort of mantra I've heard elsewhere, but my philosophy is sort of clean once, sanitise twice. So what I will do is if I finish with a fermenting bin... I've learned over the years, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lazy twat, quite honestly, and I will leave things. All right? There's always a reason to leave something, and I used to leave equipment. And then you'd want it in a hurry, and it was dirty, you'd not cleaned it, and because it dried on, it just made the whole process worse. I try and be a lot more thorough, to, now I'm an adult, uh, and to try and make sure that I clean everything as soon as I've finished using with it. And once I've cleaned it, then I will sanitise it. And then I just leave it. You can put it away. And then when you want it, all you need to do is give it a quick sanitise. And the stuff that I use is the stuff that most homebrewers use, which is not 
uh, Ashbeck English Natural Mineral Water. This has something called Star San in it, which uh, which is why it's foaming up there when I do that. And Star San is mainly phosphoric acid with some kind of a, a bubbling -y, detergent -y agent that will make it nice and bubbly. I don't get a normal detergent because detergents can actually damage the head of beer, so it's obviously one that doesn't. And it's an interesting thing because one thing about phosphoric acid is is that it is, uh, if I put my finger in it there, this is about pH two and a half, uh, but it hardly tastes of anything. You've got a really high taste threshold with phosphoric acid, but it kills bacteria, it'll pop uh, the stuff like bacteria, wild yeasts and stuff, very, very quickly in about 20 or 30 seconds. Um, but it's hard to taste. You need a lot of it before you can taste it, which makes it a wonderful thing because it means it's effectively a no rinse sanitizer. I can swirl this round here and I will do a few times. The detergent is to allow it to stick to the surfaces, but I don't need to rinse it away because the traces that are left in there, you never, it's not even close to the, the amount you would need before you could taste it in the beer, which makes it wonderful. And as long as you clean everything first properly, this is talking about separating those two processes, you can reuse this and reuse this and reuse it, and it's not a problem. And I'll reuse it until my little pH meter here. It's the only time I use my pH meter, really, nowadays is just to check that that star sound is still below a pH of three so is still working. If you're wondering about the Ashbeck <laughs> English mineral water, uh, a lot of a lot of waters are alkaline and it, it doesn't really help when you're mixing up your star sound and this is actually it's one of the cheapest sort of mineral waters you can buy in the UK um, but it's actually slightly acidic so it's absolutely perfect for, for the purpose. Uh, there so that's that's sort of my mantra with regard to that processes things are going now here We're still there with a nice temperature. We've been going about 20 25 minutes since we added that extra hot water You can see we're heating some more water up in here for sparging Which is the process of running water through those grains We've got these grains in here which should be getting a little bit sweeter. We can have a little check uh, If I just put that like that and dip my finger in and they are getting sweeter, they are getting sweeter. So the mash is progressing. And once we drain those sugars, uh, that, that wort, that sweet wort, we'll drain a lot of the sugar out of it, but not all of it. Obviously some of it's gonna be left behind. So that's when we run some sparging water through. Some people get very, very anal about getting the right temperature of their sparging water. To be honest, I've never been that concerned. It's about sort of high 70s, 80 degrees, something like that. That kind of works for me. The only time I've ever had a problem with a sparge was when I was making a wheat beer, trying to make a wheat beer. And all I made was a mash tun full of porridge, quite honestly. And, and it turns out you cannot sparge porridge, which sounds like it ought to be a saying really didn't it? it's kind of thing that captain scott or doctor whatever he is there's the engineer on star trek would say you can he sparge porridge captain uh because it turns out you can't right you you know it, it just well you imagine a big vessel through of porridge you open the tap and nothing happens <laughs> so that was a, an abject failure and i think part of that was getting the temperatures wrong which had meant that because it was a wheat beer that effectively I'd turned it all to porridge. Okay, I'll come back to you a little bit later when we get to that process, when mashing is finished and we're ready to start draining it off. Okay, so that's it, the hour's up. It's time to begin the next stage of the process. This is all nice and sweet. So what we're gonna do is we will start draining that and then returning some of it back into the top and using the grains uh, to filter that. This is our sparging water, it's about 85 degrees. I'll drain it into there and then it'll be in the high 70s by the time. And that will allow me to put the wort straight into there. Uh, before I do this, what I will do is, look, if I just get this sampling jar here, uh, this isn't gonna be easy to do while it's holding the phone. Let's see if I can do it, one-handed. Uh, there we go. Bit of one-handed operation there. All those years of wanking coming in handy. Okay, so 
you can see this is a really thick cloudy sort of stuff at the moment uh, it's about what are we at about 1080 something like that it would even be higher considerably higher than that about 1090 probably uh, if it was at uh, normal temperatures if it wasn't hot so we'll pull that back in the top and what we'll start doing is then recirculating some of this so let's start that running out of there here we go, here we go, here we go, there we go, beautiful, look at that, look at that. So we'll run that out of there and then we'll just steadily decant some of that back in the top. What we'll do is, what I usually do is run it over the spoon, put the spoon in there, run it over the top. Five litre jugs, ladies and gentlemen, if any of you are inspired by this uh, and want to get into to, to brewing your own beer, I, 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 you cannot beat a pair of large jugs you really can't um fnaf fnaf but you really can't so many uses these jugs come for uh, especially when you're dealing with large quantities of fluid you've got 30 liters of fluid it's heavy but a five liter jug it's only five you know six jugfuls and you're there uh, and it's, so it's easy to move fluids about so many uses you can sterilize stuff in them brilliant bits of kit five litre jug so i'll let that jug fill i'll have to put the camera down because i can't hold the spoon hold the vessel etc at the same time but i'll transfer that back into the top i'll keep doing that several times once it's done that several times uh, then at that point i'll start to actually put it in the boiler meanwhile i'll empty this boiler of the water put it into this vessel so that i can then start putting it straight in the boiler and get straight on with the boil okay i better put this down and swap these jugs over Okay, so let me show you where we're at now. We've nearly drained all that water out of there. And the action of keep running these through has actually dragged that grain bed down a bit now. And it's acting hopefully like a bit of a filter. And if I just pull this to one side now uh, and fill this up, it should be looking a fair amount clearer than it was. Let's have a little look, see what this looks like. Yeah, it's looking a different animal now. I mean, it's not clear as in you would, uh, from finished beer. This is still raw beer. It's full of proteins, which will come out in the boil. But all the crap's been taken out of there. So we won't now put that back in. That will not now go back in the top. We'll now start to actually uh, drain this off and then start putting some sparging water in the top. Uh, so it's going along really nicely now. So once that jug fills, this should be empty and it is it's empty it's as good as empty so we'll switch that last bit off there's just the dregs of the water in the bottom there so that's absolutely fine we'll start putting that in once the elements are covered then we can switch them on and start that part of the process so really it's just a case of keep filling these up swapping them over using me two jugs putting it in the boiler and uh, in between that I'll, I'll put one in there and then every jug I tip in there I'll put another water in there and then start taking some hydrometer readings just so I know sort of when I get to the end point where I've got all the sugars that I'm actually going to get out of there so we'll do that and then we'll start talking about the boil stage and I'll show you I've, I've laid out over there uh, the things that's going to go into the boil so you can see what it's about and we'll discuss what the purpose of the boil is just thought this was a nice shot to show you just how clear this is now. Uh, you, look like, you see me pouring that in. That, that grain bed is really working to filter it as we pour that in there. Uh, just thought that was worth showing you. Okay, so you can see we're starting to see a lowering of gravity now. We're down at about 1,040 mark. There's still useful sugars in this, uh, but we're starting to get somewhere along that path we're not going to stop yet we'll put a little bit more water in this i need to get the water in quite quickly actually because we're draining away uh, but we, we've got the the original work is out now and we're now that, that sparging water is starting to work its way through okay so we're back on me and, and while this is filling let me talk you through the boil and let me show you what's happening in here uh, you'll see we're not at the boil yet but we're starting to get proteins on the top of the beer and this is one of the reasons why we boil beer there's three reasons really there's three things that we're trying to achieve uh, with the boil one is that we're going to add the hops okay and that is important we're going to add the hops and originally I mean hops have been added to bitter because to beer uh, because what they found is that by doing so beers last longer and you're also creating an environment that the, the yeasts that you use in brewing are quite tolerant of, of the uh, 
acids, the alpha acids that are that are in the hops that give the bitterness, but a lot of other wild organisms are not. So you're creating an environment that will favour the, the yeast that you want, and you're less likely to get an infection. Okay, this is also one of the reasons why you aerate the wort. You get a lot of air into your beer because brewer's yeast works well aerobically, also works well anaerobically. So it gets a head start on those things which will uh, try and infect your beer, which only really work anaerobically. So it gets a head start with that, but when the oxygen is used up, anything that can only work anaerobically is now in a bit of a pickle, but the brewer's yeast can carry on. So we're creating an environment that works for us all the time. So one of the things is we can add the hops, get the bitterness out the hops if we add them early on, give them an hour or so in a boil. Um, but the other thing that we're doing with that, with the hops, uh, is if you add the hops later, you'll get aroma from the hops, you'll get taste from the hops, okay? So that's the thing with the hops. The other things that we're doing is we're kind of sterilizing the beer, we're killing everything that's in there. Uh, so it, one thing that means is, is that we don't have to be too concerned, as I said prior to the end of the boil, with everything being absolutely sanitized, okay? So it grants us a little bit of leeway there. The third thing that we're doing is removing the proteins. And Julie, what you will see is, is that this stuff that's forming on here, I don't know if you can see it or if it's, we're getting too much steam, but this stuff that's forming on here, this is called hot break. And it will really, at first, what will happen is, as it starts to boil, it will really throw those proteins out. Um, sometimes you have to sort of mix it back in to stop them slopping over the top. Some people even skim them off the top. But those proteins will start to coagulate and fall back in. And that's part of why you boil to remove protein. So you'll get that hot break. And that is the first stage of the protein coagulation removal. What we can also do is if we cool the beer quick enough at the end, is that we'll get something called cold break. And I'm just removing this, putting the next uh, jug across. We'll get something called cold break as well. If we crash cool it, if we get it cooled in about sort of 15, 20 minutes, then we'll get cold break as well. And you will see that, and that's quite dramatic. You'll see all the stuff uh, coagulate out and so this is removing the protein we don't want a lot of protein in our final beer if you want a clear beer if you want a clear a beer that's again likely to be stable and last uh, then you want to try and take that protein out your beer i'll show you the different things that we're going to be putting in the boil in a minute just let me wrap up with this barging operation and then i'll talk to you about that okay so here we are and these are the things that are going to go in during the boil, uh, not including the craft knife. A craft knife does not go in the boil. Uh, it wouldn't add any taste components, I don't think, and you may end up cutting your fingers on it. We know the hops are gonna go in. We've discussed the hops already. This recipe, of course, it calls for this Belgian uh, candy sugar. So that will have to go in. I'll have to take a little bit of it out and, and mix that in, of course. Then we've got two other things that are important. Well, relatively important, perhaps important. This is yeast nutrient, and is it strictly necessary? Probably not. I've, I've, most of the brews I've ever made have been without it, but it's one less thing to be concerned about. It makes sure that you've got some of the nutrients that you yeast necessarily need during fermentation, so we can add that. The interesting thing about this product is just how little you need. 23 liters, 0.23 grams. I think that's about a hundredth of an ounce, which let's be honest, that takes a bit of weighing, doesn't it? Um, so the interesting thing about that, it's a tiny, tiny amount, a hundredth of a gram per liter. So I bought these um, scales here if i can get them to switch on and i bought this these these weigh in hundreds of a, a gram and they were ever so cheap they're only six pounds and i bought them in incidentally from a shop that sold them they sell darts equipment and they sold these as equipment for people who may wish to weigh their darts i don't know why a darts player would feel the need to do that but I, it kind of got me wondering about these scales what most people i can't imagine that a very great percentage of the sales of these scales goes to people weighing their darts or weighing their yeast nutrient and i will wager that the vast majority if you were a police officer and you intercepted somebody's mail it would be a fair call that they were buying them 
<laughs> to weigh drugs, I would think. I'd imagine they usually have cocaine sat on there. And actually, my next door neighbour is a police officer, uh, but he's away at the moment. <laughs> And I'm feeding his cat, so I probably won't get any complaints. And he does know that I brew. And then we've got these. These are Protoflock tablets. And we talked about, didn't we? We talked about the hot break and the cold break that happens at the end to remove the protein. These help the protein to coagulate. We put these in the last quarter of an hour of the boil. And they increase the chances of getting a good cold break when we quickly cool that wort down uh, and i think you'll see it'd be quite dramatic when that happens okay let's put the last of these uh, the last of this malt in it's filling up here we can probably take a reading actually uh, just to see where we're at if i take that over to there pop that in there take a bit of a reading and hopefully we'll find we've got nearly all the sugars out of this i i'm not going to take this all the way i'm not going to get every last bit of sugar out of this which i often would sort of take it down to sort of a thousand and five or something like that i'm not going to do that on this because it's it, i'm making quite an alcoholic drink and i could end up just with too much liquor if i'm not careful so we're, we're at about a thousand and twenty actually so if i taste that i can still taste the sweetness in that um I can still taste the sweetness in that, but it's probably about as far as I need to take it, to be fair. I'll finish filling that jug in and that will be it because I've simply got enough and I'll end up not being able to make the 1070 gravity unless I boil it for an extra hour or something to, to, to drive off uh, more liquid. So that's probably what I'm going to do now. Okay, so we've definitely finished with that. If we look at where the line is sort of on here, where are we? We're about there, aren't we? This is a 60 litre bin. We're looking to finish with about 23 litres. So we've probably got about the right amount of liquid, I would think. Now, what I'm going to do is I've, I, I don't usually mix in sugars. I don't normally brew with sugars. I brew all malt, but this recipe calls for this special candy rock. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to empty out some of that. Some of what we've got here to mix it in and then chuck it back in the top and then really what i'm going to do i'm just going to wait for this all to come to the boil and then i'll try and give you some shots when it really starts kicking those proteins out there because it, it's uh, it, it really is amazing how how much it kicks up okay so i don't know how well this bit will show up but i put a temperature probe in there we can see we're at 97 degrees and duly look at what is happening it's starting to really kick out there's a really thick layer now uh of the of the hot break maybe if i stand up here uh you'll get a good view of it and that's going to get thicker and thicker uh and then it will all start to fall back in again and that's okay it will come out it will come out it will coagulate during that boil because that's what that boiling process is doing it's causing the coagulation of those proteins and that's one of the reasons we're doing it um if i grab a spoon just give me a second here Try not to tread on my thermometer. Little tip to anybody, if you're going to brew, is to have several thermometers because there's every chance that along the way you'll you'll tread on it or break it one way or another. And um, I mean, you can see how thick this is, right? There's a lot of a lot of material on here that's been kicked out. Oh, you can just see the liquid layer below there. It's getting frothier and frothier. And and I've had it with this amount. I've had it before, sort of getting up to here with more liquid in here i've had it right up to the top um so yeah you can imagine what it's like it can end up frothing over your boiler you can see what's happening now look at it, it's getting up it's coming up let me take that thermometer probe out because uh, it doesn't like it's look at what's happening now up we go i told you this would be quite dramatic and if you're not here this is where you can get a boiler because this is a darker beer it's it's throwing more at, and look at this it's it's coming up the sides it's coming up the sides ladies and gentlemen we can what we can do is you've got the idea i can fold some of it back in now uh, this is just a process that it's going through right it's already starting to weaken a little bit it's already starting to weaken a little bit now and we can beat it back in uh, it's not gonna it's not gonna go over the top now i think i think we're all right now so yeah you can see what's happening here. I see. Maybe it will go over the top. Let's keep. Let's keep folding. Keep folding. Keep folding. Keep folding. Um, 
I could turn one of the heating elements off, but what's the fun in that? Well, <laughs> I can risk the whole thing slopping over the top. These proteins, like I say, uh, they'll just start to fall back in. They'll coagulate with one another. Their chemistry is changing, and this is a necessary process. This is part of the brewing. The ancient brewing process is brewing your beer to get that protein out of there. Now, I'm going to turn an element off because I'm going to lose this. If I don't do that, just let it kick back down a little bit. We've still got one of the two elements going. Um, wow, that, that is, that is, I think, the most I've ever had that. I mean, if you look at where the liquid line is, the liquid line on this is sort of down, down there. So you've probably got sort of, it's doubled. It's, yeah, it's going, we're heading down now. Look, there we go. That's heading down by kicking that down. And that will go in and quite, here we go. There we go. We're over it now. I can put that other element on and we'll be okay now. Uh, it's, it, it will go right back in. It's just a process you go through and that's quite dramatic. I'd say I'm quite pleased with how that went. I can put that other one on. You can see that, that we're past that stage. It's past. What I do now is I'll chuck the hops in. I won't keep it boiling that dramatically all the way through. You want a rolling boil, but I only need one element on. Um, so... Uh, in terms of the household electricity bill, I'll, I'll be saving a little bit there. So I'm going to put the hops, get the hops now, chuck the hops in. Okay, so here are the hops. You can see that this is not a big hop addition at all that we're adding here. There are a couple of later hop additions that we'll chuck in. But it's not a particularly hoppy beer that we're creating here. Let me tell you, I told you I'd tell you a few anecdotes as I was going along. Let me tell you a few anecdotes. A little anecdote. So I've come back to brewing and one thing that has happened as I've come back to brewing is that I grow my own hops now okay so let me show you I'll take you on a little walk let's do a walk and talk so I've started growing my own hops but I'd never brewed with my own hops and so I went back to my own first brew back I go back to my old recipe and it required uh, 90 grams of goldings or maybe 100 grams of goldings and Goldings and do not have the same alpha acid content as my hot plant. This is my hot plant here. It's now uh, obviously past its best. This is first gold. And they have an alpha acid content uh, as purportedly of about 8% and the Goldings hops of about 4%, uh, 5%. So you can see the difference here. So I should be using only about half as many hops, about 50 grams of hops. However, because I am growing them and not a professional grower, I didn't really have very much confidence that they would have the alpha acid content that they should have, and, con and in fact, no confidence whatsoever. So rather than putting half the amount in, I actually put 150 grams in, because I thought, I just imagine it's just not gonna bitter them at all. Here are some of the hops that I've grown. This is, this is the harvest from this year. Um, I put in last year's harvest, in fact, mainly there. Vacuum seal them and then freeze them and they last and last and last and last um i could not have been more wrong <laughs> the beer that i made was tremendously bitter uh, painfully bitter at first fortunately it's kind of mellowed a little bit i think I, I maybe started just drinking it and it hadn't quite finished clearing and it's maybe dragged a little bit of the bitterness out but it's still incredibly bitter i'm calculating it at about 90 to 100 IBUs, International Bitterness Units. As comparison, this beer will be less than 30. Uh, so, yeah, a little bit of a miscalc there on the first brew back. But uh, it's given me, at least I've got some confidence in my own hops now. Right, I'm actually growing some hops that, that, are, that are performing as they should perform. Okay, so I'll leave this to boil now. I'll give this about three quarters of an hour. After three quarters of an hour, there will be another hop addition of about maybe twice as much as that. Um, and we'll be putting the protoflock tablets in as well at that time. And the... the Yeast nutrient can go in about that time. We've already put the sugar in. I've already done that. Okay, so I'll get back to you a little bit later. Just leave that boiling. Nice rolling boil is what you want. Don't spare on the boil. Okay, so at the quarter of an hour to go stage, we're going away. They're boiling away there. And we're at the stage to add more stuff. So it turns out it's the rest of these hops, really. The rest of the packet will be right, given the, the alpha acid content of those hops for what we're brewing. 
I thought you might be interested in seeing that's what that yeast nutrient looks like. So these are the bits we're going to add. We're not adding the pot noodle, by the way. I'm going to eat the pot noodle. Height of culinary excellence <laughs> there. So I'm going to add those now. The other thing I'm going to add is this coil. In fact, I'll put this in straight away. So this is going to be the cooling coil. I've given it a bit of a clean. That's all I really need to do is to give it a bit of a clean. Uh, make sure it's not all covered in sort of nasty copper oxide. Chuck that in there. And so what that is doing therefore is it's making sure that that is sanitized there i'll give it a bit of a spray before i use it this i will then run the hose through there and that will uh, be used to cool the wort afterwards so let's take this over here and let's see if i can put that in there okay let's put that in there and then let's put these hops in like that so they want 15 minutes those hops the remainder of those hops i'll stir those in there and uh, then in five minutes i'll put the the proto flock in okay so an update i did say to you at this point this is where things need to be a little bit uh, more higher sanitation so i've had everything in there with star sound everything has been covered in star sound all this stuff my hands my phone has been sanitized um all this has been sanitized i have a star sound spray so i can give things a final spray especially important on those jugs because i will have those jugs fully in the wort as part of the aeration it's quite a hairy aeration process mine some people some home brewers will view it and will be like oh my god because they're a little bit antsy about air even though they know they need to get the oxygen in there so we've taken that coil out again i've even stair on the top of that coil we've got some water going through it there so we're already on with that so what i will start to do is i'm going to use those hops as a filter we've got the copper piping in the bottom of there that will allow the hops to act as a bit of a filter so what we will do is we will use one of these jugs and um what i'll do with that jug just trying not to knock my uh hydrometer jar over so uh yeah I'll, I'll run some through the first couple i run through i'll put back in and so that will drag the hops down and then we can start to run the wort into there we've so we've already got water coming out of there so we're going to start cooling it as soon as we can so i'm going to get on with that now okay one thing i've learned with my equipment is the importance of not doing this too fast uh, because what tends to happen is it will drag those hops down and they will effectively bind up uh, the pipes, you know, and it will seal it, and then it'll, you'll end up, actually you think, oh, I'll turn the tap on more and do it quicker, it'll actually go slower. It'll almost come to the point of stopping. So it's important not to try and do this too quick. I'll maybe do two of these jugs, recirculate two of these jugs, and I'll start to allow it to run out. And it might take 20 minutes to run out, but that doesn't matter because we're cooling it as it's running in there, okay? So we're getting on with the cooling process straight away. So okay, only the second, uh, only the second bucket through, about four or five liters run through, and already that's how clear it is. So I, I'm not even going to bother returning anymore. It's just got, it's going straight in there now, because uh, that's wonderful. The hops are doing a wonderful job of filtering down some of that debris. It's the proteins, it's the bits of the hops themselves. It's called trub in brewing, or if you're an American and you can't pronounce your words properly, as Americans are wont not to be able to do, it's they call it trub for some inexplicable reason. But there you go, so that's running into there. That will start cooling straight away. Once it is cooled, we can start to get some oxygen into there. There's no point really busting a gut to oxygenate it at the moment for the simple reason that a, a hotter water just doesn't hold as much oxygen as you will have ever known if you watch one of these wildlife programs about the Arctic waters and <laughs> there's so much life in them. So we need to cool it down first and then we'll get on with that process. So we're just going to allow that to run out. Little shot of the whole thing there on what is a, a really, really lovely day uh, <laughs> for being out here brewing all going along very 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 nicely that can go in there there these are all going to need a bit of cleaning again because again as i say everything needs to be kept really well sanitized so i'll give them a run out and uh, and then give them another spray with the star sun for when i need them again in a few moments i'm hoping you might better see from this the sort of steam coming off the outlet water there uh, which just gives you a a visual representation of how well that simple copper coil arrangement 
works. Um, one thing I'll just talk to you about while this is this is working, and we're getting on pretty well there. We've already collected. I don't know where's the scale on the side. Can we find it? Where is the scale on the side? It's round here. We've collected about 12 litres, so we're sort of just over halfway, I think. Um, sanitation is a really interesting thing. Brewers are obsessed with sanitation, but it's what I've learned is, is that it's really unpredictable. You can think you've got the sanitation all right and the slightest thing must have gone wrong and it, you get an infection. And other times you just seem to strike it lucky. I, years back when I lived with my parents when I was in my early 20s, so 25 years ago now, I used to brew in a smaller container to this, but a similar container to that, white fermenting bin, standard sort of thing with a lid and you put a, an airlock on the top, but using top fermenting ale yeast, you get a really good head of yeast at some point. And just like some commercial brewers do, with, they can have open fermenting vessels for, for those kinds of uh, English pale ale style. It's quite a traditional thing to do. You don't even have a top on it. So I would often leave the lid sort of half on and half off because the beer at that point is protected by the yeast head. And it's only later in fermentation, I'd clamp the lid down and, and put the, uh, the fermentation lock on the airlock so that was the situation and m my father had told me during the day he said the, the cat was looking a bit sort of strange and, and disheveled and couldn't understand why and then later on in the day he captured the cat he, he caught the cat and he said he said you're not going to believe this but the cat's all sticky i don't know what the hell's happened to the cat it's all sticky and I had meanwhile noticed, I'm sure you can put the pieces together now, I had noticed that uh, my lid was, uh, had sort of shifted so it was teetering right on the edge. And then it dawned on me and I checked my carpet and parts of the carpet were sticky and the cat had fallen into the beer. Now, any sane human being at that point would tip the whole thing away. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I thought, well, let's just see what happens. So I carried on with fermentation, and it just goes to show a, a, a whole cat had been added to you know, 40 pints of beer, a relatively small amount of beer, and it wasn't infected. It actually produced a, a nice pale ale. Um, the, the, the commercial brewers didn't take that on as a strategy, it must be said. Um, it's still seen as a somewhat fringe activity to stick a small domestic cat in your beer. But that's the interesting thing. And then other times, the slightest thing can seem to give you an infection. All you can do is the best that you can do, I think, with regard to that. Uh, and maybe making sure that a cat can't jump in. Okay, so we've almost run the lot out now. We can see that we've, we're about there, actually. If you have a look where the 20 litres is and the 25 litres is, we're about on the 23 litres. We're down to 48 degrees uh, and we're just getting the last little knockings out of there. At this point it's really helpful just to keep agitating this. It brings the temperature down a lot quicker. So I'm going to do that until I get that down um, hopefully to about 25 degrees or something like that. And then when I do that then I'm going to transfer it and oxygenate it. Try and get a load of air in there. Uh, so you'll see me do that in a bit, but let's just try. I'm just going to keep working this, try and bring this down, and then uh, I'll let you know when I've done it. Okay, so here we go. So this isn't going to be easy. I've, I've, this has been all sprayed and sterilized, uh, sanitized, I should say. So was all of this. So was my hand, because that's going to be sort of an intrinsic part of it. So what I'm going to do is first off, you just get a little bit of this. Uh, we're now down to about. 25 to 25 sorry i'm not showing you properly am i 25 to 25 and a half degrees and let's just pop that in there because we'll need a little sample of that in a bit so i'll pop that in there first i think that's excellent right so here we go so this is what i do first thing i do is just lower the amount a little bit so i just get it and just give it one of these Try and splosh it around a bit, because that's getting air in it, which is what we want to do. So if I can run it round there, that's going to help, rather than running it straight down the hole. Um, I'll do this for maybe the first two jugs. 
And then after I've done that, I'll probably frighten the pants off some home brewers. One thing I've noticed coming back after sort of seven or eight years of not brewing is that people seem to be even more concerned than they were before about removing any possibility of, of getting any infection, almost to the point that they're scared to aerate their beers. And yet they know they have to aerate their beers. And I've seen people do the very minimal thing and go, oh, that'll do. It'll have got a little, it'll have come into contact with a little bit of air here or a little bit of air there. And really it's pathetic what they've done. I mean, this isn't sufficient as far as I'm concerned. This is not sufficient, but it will be in a minute because you'll see. That's what I'll really put the willies up some home brewers in a minute because I'm going to start really sloshing this stuff around. Um, so just get rid of that one. All looks lovely. It does look lovely. Whoa, and look, we can see. Cold break. Look at that. You'll see it even more clearly uh, in the vessel in a bit. But look at all that. That is the proteins, and that will all come out. That is cold break. It looks weird, doesn't it? It's like there's something wrong with it. It isn't. That's what you want to see. That is precisely what you want to see. Right, here we go. This is why the whole jug needs to be sterile, because I'm just going to stick the whole thing in and give it big licks. I'm going to give it some of this. It's the waterfall treatment, okay? I'm getting a lot of air into this b and I've got to be really careful that I actually pour it because I'm trying to look through the... Uh, <laughs> trying to look through, <laughs> through the video camera and... Uh, I could end up pouring it all over the floor if I'm not careful. So, let's give it another one of them. Okay, so we're really getting some air in this now. Okay. Now I'll put the rest of this. Now I've done that, I'll put the rest of it in here. And then what I'll do is afterwards, I'll uh, I just rinse everything down with a hose. Once I've put the, the airlock on, I'll just rinse all this down with a hose. Because it's very, 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 very sticky, this. Okay, this beer is going to be... Uh, this beer is going to be about 1,070. It should be about 1,070. So it's a strong beer. So there's a lot of sugar there. Uh, and it makes for a very, very sticky, especially all over my garage floor. If that dries on there, I'm going to have a sticky insect encouraging garage floor. Okay, I'll turn the phone off just to complete this, if you don't mind. Okay, so I've took that hydrometer reading, I've emptied it now, but if anything, it's a little bit high. Look, at we've certainly got some air into there, haven't we? We're slopping, <laughs> slopping that in. So what I will do is I'll give this all a clean off in a minute. I'll just see if a little bit more of that can go in. And again, look, you can see that, uh, you can see that cold break there, uh, really quite dramatic. And as it starts to fall out and uh, it will, uh, conglomerate a bit conglomerate that's not the word I'm looking for but coagulate a bit more and it'll look even more impressive as it goes on we've just got over 22 liters and we're maybe a little bit strong on the alcohol about 1074 1075 so it looks like we're about spot on there okay so it's the clear up stage you don't need to to see about that that all needs a good rinse down and a good clean um, the beer is here it will be going in the house so I've topped it up by about a litre, just over a litre, something like that. So at about 23 and a half litres, I don't know if you can see that. And I don't know how well you can see what's going on here. If I can brighten it up a little bit. Um, it's disturbed it a bit, chucking a bit in there, but I hope you can see what's going to happen here. And I can tell you from experience that this will go through a phase now. I mean, it looks like something from another planet, doesn't it? Uh, well, you can see outside of where that uh, that break material is, which will fall down to the bottom, compact at the bottom. Outside of that, it's really, really clear. And that's the process, the boiling process. That's what we're hoping to do. We've taken those proteins out uh, of the beer. We're coagulating them, we're bringing them out. And they will fall down until they form just a small part at the bottom. And then we can actually remove them with this, with this butterfly valve here, which is, we will actually do that because we want to harvest the yeast later on in the fermentation. And you'll find actually at that point, uh, this is a darker beer, so it might not work, but with the paler beers, you can actually see right through the beer. It's really, really clear. Then the yeast kicks in and it all 
goes really really murky again because the yeast are doing it and it will sort of almost boil with the yeast it'll look like it's almost boiling in there it's quite it's quite um frightening if you've not seen vessels before clear vessels for fermenting and you just don't realize how much is going on in there um but we're not at that stage yet so i'll leave this out here for a little bit i'll take it in the house uh, in a few moments and uh, but i'll do the clear up first leave it out here i'll show you the odd update on what this looks like as it progresses uh, so this is about i don't know 10 or 15 minutes uh into the uh after putting it into the fermenter so i'll give you a few little updates uh, nothing major and, uh, and then we'll pitch the yeast a bit later okay so about an hour later now we're in the house and this is where we're at now and you can see there's kind of a big delineation now uh, with this stuff really starting to fall to the bottom and then gradually this will all fall down uh, over the next period of maybe 12 hours. A bigger concern for me at the moment is this yeast pack which really isn't swelling the way that it should have done despite, I mean it's only about a month since it's, uh, it, it's uh, date that it was made and these 19th of September and what about the 23rd 24th of October so I'm a bit concerned about that it's been kept in the right conditions I've released the uh, I've given it a smack and, and and so the nutrients should be mixed uh, and the real concern is if I pitch it and nothing happens I don't have another Abbey yeast all I'll have is an English ale yeast I mean English ale yeasts I suppose are on a million miles away you're still get, going to get some of the same taste, but it, it's really not quite right. So um, I'll be a bit disappointed if that doesn't work. So what I'll do is I'll pitch this a little bit later tonight, give it a chance to see if it swells, and then we'll give it 24 hours and see what happens in here. Um, and if nothing happens, then I'll have to try pitching some, some ale yeast. Okay, I'll keep you updated. Okay, so here we are. It's now the next day, and I look that strain of yeast up, and apparently it is a notoriously slow starter. So... I pitched it last night in the packet. You can see all that trub is now settling down and this is all looking very clear. The airlock looks like it's not doing anything. That's because I've adjusted it. I have seen a bubble. Uh, I've seen a bubble uh, this morning and there's the tiniest, tiniest amount of activity, but not a lot to be seen. I would hope that by the end of today, it is looking substantially more hectic than it is there. Okay, I'll uh, give you an update. Okay, so it's a bit of a follow-up here. It's been about 20, do, 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 24 hours since I pitched the yeast. And yeah, it's a little bit like I feared with that yeast. It doesn't appear to be doing anything. So rather than risk it any further, I'm going to pitch a couple of sachets, uh, which I've just been rehydrating there of Sapphire SO4, which I had on standby. It's not ideal because it doesn't have the same characteristics, but I want to make sure I get some beer out of this at the end of it, not to have wasted everything. Okay, so I've just loosened this. Um, in case any of you are wondering, by the way, just to forestall any comments about um, Light Strike, I've been keeping a, a t-shirt over the top of this, uh, so... There you go, right, okay, so let's put this in, let's give it a swirl around, pick it up. This is in a bit of bo totally properly boiled water, uh, so we know we're not introducing anything there. Two sachets, so we're sticking plenty in there. Okay, let's give these a bit of a, a, bit of a spray as we put them in. Uh, I might have to put this phone down for that, so just assume I have. I'm going to give this a little bit of a spray with the, uh, with the sanitizer on there and put it back on. And then hopefully, before I go to work tomorrow, this will be properly fermenting. So we will see. Okay, so here we are back again. We're now about well, four and a half, five hours after the previous one. And yeah, mixed feelings. I didn't, it's a shame that I had to pitch that other yeast. Uh, it's not really what I wanted to do. I wanted to use the yeast that would be true to type. That said, Safael SO4, it's an English ale yeast. It, it will work well with the ingredients. It'll still give a good beer. And there comes a point where you think, well, I've spent <laughs> the ingredients, right? I've put the time in and I want to see something back from it. I'm just, just going to lose everything that I've got here. And you can see here, there's quite a lot of, of buoyancy now. And we're getting a bit of a yeast head uh, cropping up there. So that's looking much, much, much healthier. You can see there's a layer of yeast on top of that trub. 
uh, at the bottom and that has sedimented down a lot. Now tomorrow, tomorrow I'm at work for 24 hours. I work 24 hour shifts, so I won't be able to show you the progress, but I will tomorrow morning when I get up uh, show you before I set off. And I expect to see this looking something like it's boiling, right? That's what I'm expecting to see, something pretty impressive. And I hope we don't miss most of that over the 24 hours that I'm away. If we do, what I will do is I have some footage actually of a previous bat, so I could always show you that. Okay, but it's looking good. I'm feeling a little bit more secure with this batch now I'm seeing that. Okay, so I lied. I'm showing you this. This is only an hour, about an hour later after I last showed you it. You can maybe see that that has really thickened up. It is about to go ballistic. And look what is taking place underneath the surface. It's really, 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 really starting to kick off now and that is only going to get that, that it's only going to get more aggressive wow in one hour it's really really kicked in okay so it's the morning with 10 hours on and the airlock is telling a story i think isn't it uh as is the yeast head which is now built up i think they'll build up more probably up to about here uh, but you can see where we're at and it's going mad in there now that's nice and getting nice and compact at the bottom and it's properly actively fermenting now so i won't be able to show you this now for about another 28 hours something like that till i get home and have a chance to show you it again and so we it should have gone past the peak of fermentation i would have thought by then given how rapidly it's fermenting at the moment okie doke so here we are again 28 hours later we're still fermenting but a fair bit slower, as you can see. Okay, so here we are, we're several days later. It's Tuesday now, we brewed on Wednesday, so we're six days later. And I wanted to show you the progress here. I've just taken the T-shirt that I sling over the top to protect it from the light. I think you might have caught it bubbling there. It is still fermenting, but it has slowed down a lot. Let me show you the surface so you can see what's going on there, and you can probably see a few little bubbles just popping on the surface there is still activity there and the beer i think is in quite an interesting situation when you get to this stage it's in quite a safe situation now uh, some of the worries that we had earlier now are gone effectively if we're going to get an infection we probably have got it what you have now here you have a hopped beer of course which provides some protection you've got a blanket of carbon dioxide above there and you have no oxygen in here and you have this well-established yeast that has already consumed most of the food the sugars the things that would have attracted the microbes that microbes could have multiplied and fed on um so you're in a quite a quite a safer place now in fact the thing that usually spoils with beers further down the line if they haven't already got an infection is oxidation it's just a process of oxygen getting in and making the beer taste not so good rather than the beer actually going off going moldy something going terribly wrong so it's in a pretty safe scenario now like i say i'll maybe leave it sort of another four or five days i think at this point I, 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 if I was putting it in a keg, you can see that you can see it's still quite cloudy. There's still some fermentation going on. That wouldn't be a problem putting it in a keg, and it could just finish that last bit of fermentation. Maybe last couple of points of gravity. That would be no problem. But because we're bottling it and it's a sealed container, and the priming sugars we put in will be providing that fermentation to provide the CO2 that is in solution. We've got a bit of an issue. If we don't know how much more fermentation there is to take place now, it's an unknown quantity. Um, it could be that there's quite a lot of more residual sugars, uh, sort of harder to ferment sugars in there. You could actually end up creating a series of bottle bombs uh, that were very, very highly pressured. Uh, and a little bit dangerous or at least would sort of foam and froth uncontrollably when you let the when you took the the the, the cap off the top of the bottle and um, so what we need to do is we need to allow that to sort of finish attenuating as much as it will do and then then i've got a bit of a decision to make and, I, and i'm not entirely sure which way i go what some people do is they make up their priming sugar. They take their priming sugar, mix it up, boil it up with some water, then put it in a bottle, the bottom of a vessel, uh, like a bucket, what they call a bottling bucket, and then they 
siphon the beer off here into the bottling bucket so it all mixes with the priming sugar takes you off the, the yeast cake at the bottom and then you take it from there into the bottle so that has the advantage of getting the yeast out of it uh, out of the equation so you're not dragging that into the bottles or disturbing it and it has the advantage of mixing that solution up I might do that, but I can. I have a butter valve on here, so I can drop that off here and take that out of the equation without taking it out the vessel, without including that extra step. And I've got it like a glass pipette. What I'll probably do is create the the sugar solution, the priming sugar solution, and then pipette uh, the requisite amount into each bottle, and then come straight from here, siphon straight from here into each bottle. But that remains to be seen. Anyway, that's where we're at right now. And then I'll give you another recording, possibly the final recording, in about four or five days' time, I think. Okay, so here we are again. Uh, we are two weeks in now, which I think some people probably leave it longer. I get a bit of a nosebleed leaving it too long, to be honest. And I think the SO4 yeast, which I ended up pitching, it does ferment pretty quick. You can see there... You can see we're getting some clarity. This is a dark beer, so you're not going to see straight through it. But we're getting quite a bit of clarity there. And the, the action in the in the um, airlock has pretty much entirely stopped now. So I think I'm happy to do that. So I'm going to have to mix up some sugar solution, boil that up, get that ready to go. I've had a bit of a rethink about this going via a bottling bucket rather than just putting the sugar straight in each bottle. And I think I'm going to do that. I'm going to raise this up onto here. I'm going to decant it into a sanitized bucket. And the reason is then I can just leave uh, the siphon resting in that bucket. I'll take that bucket into the garage. I can leave it slightly canted on an angle so I can get all of it out. And I don't have to worry about sediment at all. So I can leave that end of the siphon. And I've got two hands to deal with the bottles, with taking the caps off, putting the caps back on and dealing with the bottling wand. Okay, so that's really how I'm gonna do it. So the first step is gonna to be to lift that up, which I'll be getting on with, and then I'll do a bit of sanitizing. And today is the day. So here are the bottles, all looking very shiny indeed. And what you have got here are 46X Young's Special London Ale bottles. Young's Special London Ale is a bottle conditioned beer, so you know that they are of the right quality. Uh, to hold a beer that is actually going to carbonate within uh, the bottle. Now, what I found is I've got over a hundred of these bottles put to one side. The best way I found, if you want a collection of bottles like this to put your own beer in, is to go out and buy a hundred plus bottles of beer and then drink the contents of those bottles. It's kind of like a double whammy, really. <laughs> It's a double bonus. You get to drink over 100 bottles of nice beer and then you end up with the bottles at the end. You can kind of justify your alcoholism for a short period of time. So what we're going to do is we've got our caps. We've got 46 bottles there. I think I'll probably need about 45, but I just wanted to make sure. They're going to go in there and we're going to get a little bit of this star sun solution in there. So that's the solution. That's the sanitizing solution. The, the, the sort of... What we're going to be doing now is chucking a few bottles in here. We'll fill them full. These have already been cleaned, these bottles. Uh, so what they need to do, they need to be sanitised. We'll chuck them in there. We'll fill them full of the water. We'll give them 30 or 40 seconds. We will then rinse them out afterwards. Um, and then once they're rinsed out, remember it's a no-rinse sanitizer. If I rinse them out, I just mean empty them out. Then effectively, I'll put them on the floor, take one of these sanitized caps, and I will just put the cap on the top. And so that is then ready to go. Line them up. And then once we've got the beer in there, I can just take a cap off uh put the beer in and then once the beer's out put the cap back on it's ready to go and then we use the capping tool which is an old tool i've had about 20 years now uh, to put the cap on the bottle and that will be the, the the beer sealed in the bottle so let's see how that goes okay so half an hour on and just feel, filming this halfway through you can see i've got most of the bottles done and here they are you can probably still see the bubbles in there uh, which is the star sound that's absolutely fine because it is a no rinse sanitizer and in in those concentrations the phosphoric acid has no taste so they are lovely and well sanitized in there we've got a few more in there this is the bucket that we will be using as well uh, as the bottling bucket so we're i'm working the, the sanitizer around there uh, and the same thing with the siphon 
This is our little bottling wand here, which has that little one-way valve there. That will then go on the end of the siphon once you've got it in the bucket. So that what effectively you can do is you just drop that down the bottle. When it hits the bottom of the bottle, it allows it to flow. As soon as it gets up to the top of the bottle, you lift it up and it will stop running out. And then as you draw this out, you can imagine the volume of the tube uh, is then subtracted from what you've got in that bottle. Uh, which gives you that ullage space, that air space that you need so that you don't create a bomb. If you had the liquid level right up to the top, there would be nowhere for any gas to go and you could end up uh, in a world of pain. Uh, so that's effectively how that works. So we'll see how we get on. I'll get the last of these bottles done and I'll take the bottling bucket inside, siphon the beer off into the bottling bucket, bringing the bottling bucket back to here and then one by one fill these bottles. Okay, and we're off. So this is, it's not easy to film this and do it. We filmed up that. I started in there just to get it going. Uh, I filled that so I can take my sample. And here we go. So we fill a bottle up. It comes to the top. I can see it at the top. There we go. I actually overdid that a bit. So I'm drawing that out. I'll put the top from the next one across and just keep going. Okay, that's all the filming I can do, I'm afraid. Because I've only got two hands. Oh, okay, few done. <laughs> uh, we have got what have we got? Forty bottles there, so that's twenty liters. Uh, and I got nearly everything out of there, and that was at the point whereby I couldn't really get any more doing this operation on my own. We've got a final gravity of about thousand and twelve thousand and thirteen, which is pretty good considering the initial gravity was really high in the thousand sixties. So that isn't really a problem. Uh, so now it's a case of putting these caps on properly. You will be able to see, I think, the ullage space in the top. They're all beautifully filled, I think. A little bit of beer on the floor, so I will sweep that out the garage with a hose pipe. Uh, I'm going to get a little bit of a sample now, just to see what it tastes like. Obviously, it's going to taste a little bit raw at the moment, uh, but we should tell if there's any off taste. So, cheers. <sighs> Oh, that is, <laughs> that is nice. That is really, really tasty, that. Yeah, that is going to be really, really nice. There's nothing unpleasant about that at all at the moment, other than the fact it's a bit flat and a bit warm. Uh, it's 18 degrees and it's a bit flat, but it's still very tasty already, that. That is absolutely lovely. Okay, I better stop recording now. And then this will be the last video clip apart from one, I think. I'll just film one little bit after this, just giving a little bit of a sum up. Maybe a little sampling, who knows? Okay, so the story now, though, just to let you know. So what we need to do now is it's in the bottles. The sugar is in the bottles. That was added, wasn't it? I added that sugar, mixed in with the water, boiled it up, added that into the bucket, stirred it in there, very gently, not getting any oxygen in. It's all in the bottles. There will be some oxygen in these bottles. But the yeast will scavenge that. There's enough yeast in there to sort that out. And there is enough yeast in there to convert those few sugars and make the carbonation. But, 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 if I go and stick those in a fridge or even in here at, at 10 degrees Celsius, which is what this holds an average of 10 degrees Celsius, they're not going to carbonate very well. So they will go in the house. I'll leave them in a house for a week or so. Allow them to build up that carbonation and then I can reduce the temperature. Okie doke. I've got a bit of clearing up to do now, but I better put the caps on these bottles first. Okay, so don't worry. <laughs> I've, I've opened on this frame to give you a terrible foreboding sense of deja vu that we're going to go through the whole brewing process again. We're not. We're at the end of the process here. The, this beer has been in my house nice and warm for about 10 days and then I've just been chilling it today. I thought today was quite an appropriate time because we've got a bit of a brew on the go. In fact, we've got a lager on the go that is mashing in there that is then going to be kept in this vessel that is then going to go in here. You can see I've got a little heater now because it's getting so cold uh, that I c actually the freezer isn't doing anything at the moment. I need something to heat it up. So using this thermostat that has a high and low socket I can actually keep the temperature about right and I can make a lager but that's not what this is about this is about checking out this video checking out what we've got and so this is a big moment this will be the first bottle of this that I have opened 
And, well, it tasted nice when I put it in the bottle, but of course it was flat and it was a bit too warm. It should be cooler now. I'm hoping it will be properly carbonated. There's no reason why it shouldn't be. I've had it in the house warm to give it a chance to carbonate. So this is the big moment then. We're gonna open one of these bottles and see what it's like. So here we go. If it isn't, if it is too flat, then we'll have to go through the process. I'll leave it in the house for another 10 days or so and we'll see where we're at. But here we go. I thought it was an appropriate day to do it given that I'm brewing. I like the sound. I like the hiss. That's always a good sign. It's always a very good sign. Okay, let's pour some beer. Let's have a smell first. Okay, it smells nice. It looks like there's a little bit of carbonation in there. Let's pour it. Oh my word. Oh my word. It's looking good. Oh, it's looking good. It's, I tell you what, that is looking beautiful, actually. That is looking like a success story, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. Okay, I'm going to give it a taste test. Maybe I should reverse the camera for this. Hang on a minute. Okay, probably breaking the third wall by doing that. So here we are. Very nice. That is very, very tasty. The only faults I can find, it's beautiful. It's got all the tastes that you would expect, only it's slightly sweet. And if you recall, as I said at the beginning, the style should be very, very highly attenuated and have the tastes that you would associate with sweetness, but without the sweetness and this has a little bit of sweetness probably because i ended up using that other yeast but it's still gorgeous it's still really really nice it's a success okay look that's the end of the video i hope you've enjoyed it i hope like i said i hope to make a sort of home brewing video for people that don't brew and that's what i hope i've achieved so you can see some of the process maybe this video along with the one that will come alongside it might just encourage one or two people to give this wonderful hobby uh, a go that's the aim that's the aim of it let's all raise a beer and say cheers to brewing okay thank you for watching and bye